Everybody knows how to calculate the mechanical advantage of a simple machine like this one. All you have to do is take the length of this and divide by the thickness at the back end. It's a pretty simple procedure. Unless it's some kind of hollow ground blade or something like that, then it's a little bit more complicated. We do also know that it does neck down, down at the bottom, gets a little thinner, so the mechanical advantage here is different from there, but whatever. What happens, however, when you come up with a compound machine. Now this little baby right here looks like a simple pair of scissors, but you'll notice the multiple pivot points. This is not a simple machine. It's actually a compound machine. How do we go about measuring, calculating the ideal mechanical advantage of this? Well, it turns out that that simple equation, the input displacement divided by the output displacement is the way to go in this case. Take the input displacement, and divided by the output displacement. Don't worry about what goes on in here. You could cover this with like a big old plastic bag, but you just input displacement over the output displacement. Same thing with this. You can just measure, if you can look inside here and see this motor, you can measure how quickly that thing's going around compared to how quickly that thing's going around, and you got it, because you can see the shaft changes its axis of rotation. Anyway, here we go. This is my baby boy's bicycle. There's the input force at the pedal shaft and the output at the bottom of that tire. So it just rolls forward. We're going to measure it. My trusty assistant is pushing where the pedal would be and allowing the bicycle to roll forward so we can directly measure the input displacement, the output displacement, then find the quotient for the ideal mechanical advantage. The back of the back wheel started at zero, ended at a little bit more than 170 centimeters. And the radius for the circumference is about nine centimeters. The input displacement is a pedal circumference, and the IMA turns out to be 0.33, approximately. It's about a third, which means that it is a speed multiplier. It multiplies your foot speed by three times and divides your force by three. We cannot see what's happening inside the door, but we can see the input displacement and the output displacement. So let's measure it. The output displacement is the total distance moved by that latch. And the input displacement is the distance moved by that point of contact with the force. Here I can approximately mark it out so I can measure it later. And use a bendy ruler to measure the input displacement. So the input displacement is 7.5, output is 1.5, mechanical advantage is 5. That means it multiplies the force by 5 and divides the speed by 5. Beautiful. Here are the bolt cutters at the widest position. Next, we see the bolt cutters at an intermediate position. And last, we see the bolt cutters at their closed position. We can again take a bendy ruler to measure the input displacement directly. And by subtracting the minimum separation, we can get the input displacement. We'll use an output displacement of one centimeter at that position in the jaws. So for 60 centimeters input, we have a one centimeter output. That is an ideal mechanical advantage of 60. It's a big force multiplier, a big speed divider. <laughs> Again, keep going. Be strong. <laughs> For the bigger bolt cutters, we will also use an output displacement of one centimeter and use the same method to measure the input displacement. That leaves us with about 90 centimeters input, one centimeter output, and so the ideal mechanical advantage is 90, an even bigger force multiplier and a bigger speed divider. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. Hi, Mr. Taylor. So uh, tell us about this whole skeleton thing and the mechanical advantage stuff. Okay, so um, if we look at the limbs, uh, you know, if you look very carefully, or this is our humerus, we have our <laughs> radius. I know, we have to name them. But if you look at the forearm bones, uh, there's... No, it was funny. The humor. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, good. And so your biceps actually starts all the way up in here at your scapula and runs all the way down your arm and hooks onto this. And when it shrinks, it pulls. And so we have this pivot point right here in the elbow, so this would be, I guess, our fulcrum, Yep. and then we are putting our effort force, it's being applied right at this point, 
and then whatever we're carrying, our load, would be all the way out here in the hand. That a very slight contraction of the biceps leads to a very long movement of the hand. So that's what kind of multiplier? Uh, this would be, I guess, a distance multiplier. Yeah, distance or speed. And or speed, right, because it's definitely going to speed up your hand. So just a very slight twitch of the biceps causes a very fast motion in the hand. So it does both. Uh, in fact, the biceps actually pulls with uh, considerably more force than whatever you're lifting. What about the back side of that arm? Uh, the back side of the arm, you have the triceps. So the triceps comes down from the scapula and it goes down along the back side of the arm and it hooks onto this little nub here that's called the olecranon. And what it does is, once again, we have the same fulcrum, same pivot point here, and this little tiny, like, bony uh, part that sticks out is where the triceps hooks on and extends it. And so, so that again, so that little elbow thing is not just for like close quarters battle when you have to like toss somebody an elbow. Yeah, you definitely throw some bows with that one. So that very slight contraction results in a very long distance movement of the hand uh, and considerably more speed. And how about the legs? Uh, if you look, here's a really good one actually. Uh, even better than that is the gastrocnemius muscle, which is your uh, primary calf muscle down here. And so it runs, you can actually feel this in the back of your knee, it hooks on just at the end of the femur. It goes down across the back of your knee and it goes through your Achilles tendon and hooks on to the calcaneus in the foot. And so just a slight contraction of this will move your heel. But look at what the toes do. They move considerably farther. And uh, so of course we have our pivot point here in the, uh, in the ankle for that. Uh, you have your quads in the knee. Uh, they go through the patella, and so we get a considerable amount of extension from just a very slight movement of the quads. Just like the hydraulics in an excavator or a bobcat mm -hmm. do exactly the same thing. They're capable of really large forces over short distances, but they're attached to these big long arms, which make them speed and distance multipliers. So excavators, although they're commonly thought of as force multipliers, are actually speed and distance multipliers. I'm going to tell you, actually, I really love looking at those excavators because they have, if you ever look at them very carefully, they have like a piece of metal that sticks up just like this olecranon. And right back here, you'll see one of those hydraulic um, cylinders, I guess it would be. And then you'll see another one on the other side. And the one that's underneath kind of bridges the gap and it hooks onto the arm about where that spot was where I said the biceps does. So you can actually watch as those things go back. Yeah, I'm still shooting. Right? Right, that's good. So don't be telling me that you think machines can only be force multipliers because they can clearly be speed multipliers and displacement dividers. And the next time you have the opportunity to check out one of those, like, the big excavator arms that are moving the dirt all over the place, make sure that you do that and think about the fact that it is your arm and it is not a force multiplier. The mechanical advantage is less than one. It's a speed and distance multiplier. It actually takes huge forces, short distances, and gets a tiny little force out at the little hand, which sometimes you call the bucket. Have a great day.